I hope you can hear me clearly. And um, I thought to myself, I'm going to misbehave today, so I haven't worn a suit. I feel completely naked. It just feels so strange. I did put on a tie because only those wearing ties will actually get into heaven. Um, so you're in a bad way, sir. <laughs> um, just before we start, um, uh, again, thank you for um, all your love and prayers and concern and all the other stuff. Thank you so much for um, this invitation. And, and above all, I want to say thank you. It's a few weeks that I'm going to be here. And that matters to me because this may come as a shock to you, but I'm getting older. <laughs> I'm probably the oldest person here. Trust me, my, my, my body says I'm the oldest person here. Um, and so, over, particularly over COVID, I think, I've come to the conclusion, and uh, people don't get it, they've come to the conclusion that I really haven't got time to really meet with people, but I have got time to invest in people. Not because I've got more than anybody else, but because um, I'm reaching the three score and ten. Now, put your hand up if that shocked you. Put your hands up if that... And so, and so I know that some of you are saying, is that all? You're just a teenager, I know. Um, but so I'm trying to invest time. So people have said to me, can you, do, can you do a service for us? And the first question I ask is, have you got a minister? And if the answer is yes, then I'm happy to do that. But if the answer is no, um, then I, I'm just saying, I, I can't do a one-off. We have to invest the lives that we have. So I hope that doesn't sound arrogant to you, but I'm counting the days. That makes a, a little bit of sense. So thank you so much for, for this kind of invitation. And also I'd appreciate your prayers. I've just, um, I can't use the word launched. It sounds impressive when you use words like launch, doesn't it? When it's youth, like a large boat going out to sea. But um, in terms of investing what I have, and you know, I've been a Christian since I was 17 and started preaching at 21. It's been a couple of years. Um, so I, I've started a, a discipleship training a course, mostly on online, but also meetings. The cost of it is completely free. Freely I've received. Can you finish it? Freely give. And so um, what I'm doing is covering all the expenses and traveling for people and everything else, not because I'm rolling in it, but because God is good and God is faithful. And people, so I you know I saw a conference and it was something like 250 pounds for a Christian conference for a day. There's something wrong there. Um, and so since the Lord's been so kind to me, and so at the moment I can only take at the maximum 10 people because that's all I can invest my life into at the moment. And uh, we've got one in Australia, one in Wales, we've got one in Nigeria, um, and we've got uh, possibly one either in Bahrain or America, depending on where she is. And um, I'm just saying to you two things. One, please pray for that, because as a piece of work, I've got to get permission to use. And I've been trying for a year to get it, and I haven't got it yet. Um, but by the end of this month, then that part is going to be put online and then I'll just have to face the consequences of that. So please pray for that. And um, Robert's got my number. And if you are interested in just hearing about it, then please just get my number from him and then he'll, he'll give my number to you. And then you can just, we can just have a chat and then you can think of it from there. Is that okay? But please pray, about, please pray about this piece of work because I really need this to come through. Um, I can work without it, but I want to do what's right. Is that okay? I want to do what's right. And so I need to get this piece. And if it has to be paid for, that's fine. But I'm looking for um, a Christian publishing company to give it to me for free. I want to talk about the church. Is that okay? I love the church, don't you? Do you remember the old hymn, I love... Thy church, O God, wherein thine honour dwells. Yes? The old hymn that says, um, Let's go up to the house of the Lord today, for, there my fr for it's there that my friends dwell. I love the church. I love the church of God. Um, it is through a church, um, when I was 17, 
that I first heard the gospel and it was only a month ago I was talking to my minister and he's still serving the Lord at 80 and I'm just over the, over the moon about that and when I say serving the Lord yes he's no longer preaching but he is sharing and investing his life in people isn't that exciting the, to think and we can all share our lives um, in that way so again I want to just talk about the church and for the next two or three weeks, the verses that I'm going to use are from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so today and for the next few Sundays I want to share uh, something of my thoughts bless you my child <laughs> I want to share something is this me shall I put it somewhere else is this okay okay um, I want to just share a few things with you um, from those few verses that are there and as I've said to the church love it and so um, one of the most disappointing phrases that I've ever had was when somebody said to me after a conference, I didn't take the conference, they said, we'd love you to come to our church. Um, and I said, okay, just, then just ask me. And they said, we couldn't ask someone like you to come to our church. There's only six of us. And I just felt so disappointed. Do you know what I mean? And I went and preached to them and they lied to me. There was only two. <laughs> but it was just glorious, you know? And when you think as was prayed earlier on. There are countries where two is a massive congregation. Some Christians walk around their daily lives on their own, scared to share the fact that they know the Lord Jesus Christ. So today we're going to look at these, just a verse or two here. Uh, Peter has been talking to people and he's been saying to them, this is what you have. This is what God means. This is what God has done. This is what God has promised to us. And as I look at the church of God today, um, I find that the church of God has so many problems. The problems, I think it was Spurgeon that put it this way. He said, the boat in the water, no problem. The water in the boat, big problem. And I think the same thing is true, that we've lost in some ways our direction, we've forgotten the, the old paths of what those things that God would have us know about himself. I want to tell you there are great barriers that we have to overcome. I had a friend many years ago, she was Polish, and she went to Poland and uh, she came back and she said, I've got a present for you. And she gave me half a million zloty. I was a half millionaire. <laughs> half a million zloty she gave me. So I said to her, that's wonderful, thank you. How much is that? And she said, about 75 pence. <laughs> half a million zloty, 75 pence. It's lost its currency. Does that make sense? And the word Christian has somehow lost its currency when I listen to some of the programs on TV that are supposedly Christian, they've lost their currency. I don't recognize the gospel that's being spoken about. I don't recognize it. A few years ago, some friends came up from down south to see us and uh, we decided we'd go and play some badminton. So we hadn't booked a court, so we drove to our local leisure center and they decided that their responsibility was to sit in the car while I went and booked the court. So I went in to, to book this court. I explained to the receptionist, who was lovely, 
um, that we hadn't booked a court. Is it possible for us to get a court? And she said, I'll look. And she looked and we chatted. And she spoke and I spoke and we laughed and we chatted. And then she said to me, um, um, how are things? And I said, they're fine. How are things with you? And she told me about her children and about her marriage, which was in trouble. She told me about the fact that she's trying to pay bills and this just went on and on and on. And she ended up saying, I don't quite know why I've told you all this. I said, no, it's fine. No problem at all. And then my, uh, I said to her, can we have the equipment as well? And she went and got that. And my wife was still in the car. And then she said to me, okay, I'll book you in. What's your name? And I said, my name is Reverend Eddie Inglis. And she put her hands on her hips and said, this is an official document. What's your name? And I said, my name's Reverend Eddie Inglis. And she said, well, I'm going to write it down. And if you get into trouble, it's your own fault. So I said, fine. So my wife turned up and said to me, um, darling, well, she didn't actually say that, but <laughs> it impresses you a bit, doesn't it? She said to me, um, um, have we got a court? And... Um, I said, yes. And this woman turned to my wife and she said, oh, your husband is a card, isn't he? And my wife said, hmm. she said, he tried to tell me that he was a reverend. And my wife said, he is a reverend. And the woman, you could see the blood just drain out of her. And she said, he can't be a reverend. And these are her exact words. My wife said, why can't he be a reverend? And she said, because he spoke to me. That's what we have to fight out there. Do you understand? Because being a Christian in so many ways has lost its currency. And we have to fight this battle time and time again. And we have to understand how important the church is. Can I just say it again? I love the church. Can I just say that? Can you say that in your head? I don't know if you can speak, but I love the church. With all its issues and all its problems, I love the church. There's an apocryphal story told about uh, the Lord Jesus after his ascension uh, into heaven and arriving to thunderous applause from the angelic host. Um, they saw his victory, they saw his death on the cross. One of the archangels came up to Jesus and said, oh, that was brilliant. What is the rest of the plan for the salvation of the world? And Jesus answered, I've left 11 men down there. And the archangel looked at him and said with a perplexed look, what if the plan fails? What is your path? What's your plan B? And Jesus looked at him and said, there is no plan B. The church is the answer to the issues of the world. If only we could grasp that. If only you and I could grasp how much is laid upon us to share this glorious gospel. Not just in word, but in the way that we live. You see... You may not have come across this verse before. God so loved the world. I don't know you. But I can tell you this. With absolute assurance. That God loves you. And I can go even further than that. I need to because... You could ask me, do you love your wife? And I would say, yes, I love my wife. But more than that, I'm in love with her. Does that make sense? So when I say to you that God loves you, I want you to hear as well that God is in love with you. He's passionate about you. And I haven't got time to go down that line. Perhaps if you want to, I'll change some of the things that I want to preach another time. The first statement I want to make is this. The purpose of the church is not to be better than the world. The purpose of the church is to be different from the world. Although we may deny it, there is the overarching belief, both in the world and in the church, that it is filled with better people. It isn't. It's filled, the world is filled with sinners. And the church is filled with sinners. The difference is that some in the church know they've been forgiven. 
that the death on the cross of Jesus Christ was once for all. That he paid for all the sins that I have ever committed. Are you with me on that? He is with me and he's forgiven the sins that I will commit today. Are you with me on that? And he knows and he has forgiven the sins that I will do in the future. The church is filled with broken, damaged, sinful people. But the difference is that so many of those know that they are forgiven and they want to start again. And God is the God, not even of the second chance, he's the God of the millionth chance. The difference is, for the church, that we, we march to the sound of a different drum. Do you remember the old hymn, none of you are old enough? This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And you see, we live as if this world is our home. Jesus didn't die for me to have an iPad. He didn't die for me to have a six-bedroomed house, if only. He died to save me from a lost eternity without hope and without Christ. He died to save my soul. We have a, a dance to a different drum. We have a different destination. And we live in a different world. And we have a different captain who is the Lord and the ruler of our lives. Forty years ago, my mum was really poorly in the Caribbean and she wanted me to come and see her before she died. I saw her in the November, she died in the April. And I flew over to see um, my mum. And when I landed, my brother was there for me. And uh, he met me off the plane and uh, we walked across the tarmac, totally different world over there. We walked across the tarmac and we went through all the procedures. And as we were walking towards the car park where there was a taxi for me, um, my brother said to me, look, if anybody walks past you, say hello. I said, don't be ridiculous. I said, I left here when I was three. I've not been back. No one knows me here. And he said to me, look, when someone walks past you or you walk past somebody, just say to them hello. And I said, why? He said this. Things are done differently here. There's a different set of rules of engagement. That's what he said. He said in Dominica, the island where I was born, things are done differently. When you walk past someone, you say hello. It's a different way of living. No, I've come from England. I've brought all my baggage with me. I don't mean my suitcases. I mean my cultural baggage, my emotional baggage, my, the way that I do things. I've brought my baggage into Dominica. Do you know what? Not one Dominican changed their rules of engagement for me. They said, this is what we do on our island. And I'm trying to say to you and to myself as well, this is what we do in the church. This is how we live in the church. We live to a different set of rules. And we are not going to take the rules of the way the world is and bring them into the church. We're going to live in the church of God by the, the tenets and the testament and the laws of God. When you come into the church, I do not mean the building, I mean the body of Christ. We all bring our old life and methods of engaging with people. But the rules of, in Dominica did not change because I'd have arrived. And the church of God does not change its rules of engagement. How we live with each other simply because we've come from the world. Maybe there are some things that you need to learn again about scripture. We have, we have forgotten so much in this day. Perhaps there are things that we need to learn for the first time. As Christians... We must bring our new life, the life of the Holy Spirit, not only into the world, but also take this new life that God has put into us out of the church and into the world. This is how a Christian lives. This is how a Christian behaves. 
How then are we to live? Well, back at the beginning of this book, you can read it for yourselves, Peter wrote to the Christians. He calls them the scattered ones. He argues in chapters 1 and 2. He tells them by what we are saved. He tells them from what we are saved. And he tells them to what we are saved. And the rest of this letter is now that you are saved, this is how you should live. So we are discussing Christian relationships. And I just want to say that Peter speaks about our relationships with our masters and with our servants, with our husbands, with our wives, with fathers and children. And now he comes to verse 8 and he now talks to the church. And he talks to the church and he says, this is how you should live. Finally, all of you, it isn't to one person, it is to all of us. Finally, all of you. And then he describes how we should live. I'm not trying to play games, but if you could just put your hand out like that. The first one and the last one have to do with the mind. And the three in the middle have to do with the heart. There are five things I want to say quickly. The outside two deal with the mind. The ones in the middle deal with the heart. You see, to trust God is a work of heart and mind. You can't be a Christian without your mind being engaged. And you can't be a Christian even more without your heart being engaged. So what are these five things that Peter says? The first thing he says is this, unity of mind. Finally, all of you have unity of mind. Now, if you expect the church to agree upon everything, boy, are you in for a surprise. But what are the rules of engagement as we live with each other? Unity of mind is something like this. I played a lot of rugby. And rugby, a rugby team is made up of basically two groups, backwards, backs and forwards. The simple adage in rugby is this. Forwards win matches. Backs decide by how much. That's the simple rule that seems to be around. Forwards win matches. Backs decide by how much they are going to win. The activities of forwards and backs are completely different. The physical structure of forwards and backs is completely different. The training regimes for both of them is completely different. But they have one purpose, and that one purpose is this, to score, score more points and to beat the opponents. Is that okay? You see, all of us are different. Doesn't Paul say that? Some of you are eyes, some of you are legs, some of you are noses, some of you are ears. We're all different. But you see, for a church to have unity of mind is something that Peter says, finally all of you, all of you, have unity of mind. Move in the same direction. And so it comes logically, what is that direction? And the direction is this. Perhaps we can go to the catechism. What is the chief end of man? There you are. The chief end of man is this. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Can you imagine a church that walks in and says, I'm here to glorify God and to enjoy him. I don't know, I've been to some churches where I think that all the Baptists have been baptised in vinegar. They're all sour. You know what I mean? They just... They go to church as if they're going to a funeral and they leave church as if they've been to one. I'm trying to say to us that there is something about the church to glorify God. If you have that within a church, if you have that within a body of people, can you imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine what that's going to be? That if our, we said, no matter what happens, 
No matter how broken I may feel, no matter how offended I may be, I am going to aim for this and I'm going to aim for the glory of God. And when you find somebody else who disagrees with you as to whether you should have boiled ham or roast ham in the church sandwiches, if you focus on aiming at the glory of God, can you imagine what that would be like? If we could find a church like that, I would join it. If I could find a church like that, I would join it and probably spoil it. I'm asking us. Peter says, these are the five things. I've said everything, but now I'm saying to all of you, finally, all of you have unity of mind. Unity of this. Not this. Unity of this. Unity of mind. Where do we want to go? What is it we want the world to see? What is it we want the church to be? The church exists for the glory of God. The church exists to bring the lost into a relationship with Him. This is the first rule of engagement. Christians are all very different. Their likes and dislikes are very different. Some Christians like Manchester United. Some Christians like watching football instead. But a Christian wants to see Jesus glorified. People brought to new life in Christ. And all their strengths, energies and resources are put in that one direction. The direction is love Jesus. This is what we want to do. We want to show the love of God. We have to have unity of mind. And Jesus put it this way. By this. Not by these. But by this. By this. This one thing. By this. Shall all men know. Are you ahead of me? Shall all men know that you are my disciples. You ready? If you have love one for another. Can you imagine? Have I got to stay still? Can you imagine walking into a church where every single person is determined to love one another? Can you imagine what that would be like? That is not something exceptional. Jesus is saying that should be the norm. To teach others and the world by our deeds is not just us doing good deeds. Giving money to Christian organizations that are preaching Christ is not giving money. Giving money to those organizations that are helping the homeless is not giving money. What it is, is making the love of Jesus concrete. It's making the love of Jesus real. So that when you decide that you're going to give money to the third world because they need to hear Christ. And the prayer for India this morning was just superb, wasn't it? When you think about the needs that are there. When you decide, well, today is my day for giving my one pound, my five pounds, my hundred pounds to whatever organization is trying to reach out. That isn't you giving your money, that's you making the love of Jesus concrete. Do you see how you do things, or do you see it differently? I need to press on. That's the first one. The last of the five is this. It says, it says um, finally all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Now, what does a humble mind mean? It means this. The literal translation of that Greek word is this, is this, not rising far above the ground. That's what the word humble means. Not rising far above the ground. My father taught me this. He said, do not ask if a man is a friend or a foe. Ask if what he says is right or wrong. That's the first thing my dad taught me as a young boy. And the second thing he taught me was this. Always listen to a good man. He didn't say always listen to a wise man. 
He said, always listen to a good man. I want to be a good man. These are the rules of engagement. We need to have a humble mind. Well, I want you to listen. When it came to maths, I was brilliant. When I was at school, I'm not what you would call a mathematician, but numbers just fell into place for me. I was taking my high-level exams when I was 13, when everybody else was trying to count. I'm really good at maths. I was good at rugby. Look at the size of me. Look at the size of me. Someone said at our church, he said, I was a scrum half. He said, you'd never have caught me. I said, I've only got to catch you once. You wouldn't be, I wouldn't need to catch you again. <laughs> You've got to escape me all the time. I've only got to catch you once. I was really good at rugby. What's that got to do with humility? This is how God has made me. He made me rubbish at swimming. He made me rubbish at languages. When it comes to DIY, my family call me Bungle. But there are some things that I just can't do. And I glorify God in that as well. You see, it is the humility of mind, knowing that around us, God has created people. The only way I can put it is this. Do you realize that if the person next to you is a Christian, and you are a Christian, the day will come for all eternity when you will gaze upon God together. He's made them for that. You are sitting next to incredible people. Incredible people. Who sometimes get it wrong. But you're sitting next to incredible people. Peter says, have a humble mind. The middle of the three is that, is a, the middle three, the first one is sympathy. We live in a broken world. Sometimes the world is not only broken, but it's evil. I had to do a funeral service for a woman who had lost her mum. And this woman, um, I went into the house. It wasn't the most auspicious of houses. I began to talk to her. Do you remember this sinful situation in Rochdale with young girls? She was one of them. She was one of them. My heart went out. I hadn't even heard her story yet. My heart went out to her. And then I said to her as I was going through your mum's name, your, your, husband, your father's name, your sibling's name, I said, and, uh, are there any, any grandchildren? And she said, yes. I said, oh, where are they? And she said, they're in care. I said, you told me you'd gone through this Rochdale thing and your children are in care. They said, yes, the authorities said that I wasn't capable of bringing them up, so they took my children away as well. Do you understand? Are you feeling what I'm feeling? Well, that's sympathy. The difference was that she's lived with that for I don't know how many years, but that's the first time I heard her story. And some people, like you, like me, haven't told parts of our story. You may well be sitting in the same building as one of them. But we need to assume sympathy before ever we begin to talk to people. At, uh, when I was teaching, I'd finished a Friday match, refereeing a game with some children, and I'd left my shoes at school. And then I got a phone call on the Saturday, and my pastor said, uh, would you come and take the offering on Sunday? And I said, yes, real." Can you possibly take the offering without your shoes? Is it possible that I would be allowed to take the offering in trainers? Well, in our church, probably not. So I phoned up someone and said, look, I've left my shoes. He said, hey, I've got a pair, you can borrow mine. My feet are size ten and a half, his were nine. <laughs> so we got to church, I took off my, my, my trainers and I put his shoes on. Which was fine until I stood up and all my toes sort of cramped into one place. And I was walking <laughs> as if I would suffering severely from major surgery and arthritis at the same time. My wife was hysterical watching me. Because you see, it's only when I began to sort of move and live that the pinch points came into my life. 
You know there are people whose lives have got pinch points. Some of them are financial, some of them are emotional, some of them are mental health. The church is going to be almost drowned with people who have mental health issues after this COVID. They've got pinch points in their lives. And they're walking, yes, but they're walking in agony. I want to say to you, if you're one of them, whether you're sitting here or listening, Jesus knows the pinch points in your life. He knows where you hurt. He knows what is hurting you. And he wants to walk with you. Rather, he wants you to walk with him. And where you can't walk, he will carry you. That's the Jesus that we know. The middle of all those five is brotherly love. 1 John chapter 4 verse 21 says, Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Someone at the church where I was the minister said, someone at church has really upset me. I, and she said, I know, Pastor, that, that I should forgive. And I said, no. And they said, yes, Pastor, the Bible says that I should forgive. I said, no, it doesn't. She said, oh, what does the Bible say? It says you must. It doesn't say you should. It says you must. You must forgive. You see, we cannot take the rules of engagement of the world and bring them into the church. We can't do it. Can I tell you a, root, a, a, a rule of engagement that's in the world that's come into the church? And it's this. If you can't say something good about someone, don't say anything at all. Doesn't that sound good? Except it's not Christian. The Bible says this. Basically, when it comes to your speech, do not pay back, but rather bless. It doesn't say, don't say something wicked. It doesn't say, don't do something wicked. It says, bless. That's the rule of engagement. This week, and I haven't recovered from it, this month has been dreadful. This month I've buried a babby. This month I've buried someone and I just can't go into it, it's too awful. And just a couple of days ago, a young woman of 43 who was killed when she was riding her bike. That's been my week. And I was talking to one of the family and this, this her brother, younger brother, just flew at me. He just really had it in for me. And everything within me said, one more step and I'll deck you. In love, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and so I sat there and I said, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do? And I really felt the Lord said, look, just leave him to me. And I did the service and I worked extremely hard. This one service for this one family must have taken me 14 hours to prepare. And at the end of the service, he came up to me and he said, look, I'm so sorry I blew up at you. And I thought to myself, yeah, you should be. And then the Lord said, now give him your hand. And I thought to myself, where, round the throat? Or? So I put my hand out and he took my hand. And I had to show him the love of Christ even though I was wounded by what he had said. Does that make sense? Look, if that's how we live and behave with the world, how much more must it be with our brothers and sisters? Something, sometimes being with other people is tough, whether they're blood or whether they're by faith. A few years ago, I was walking through Duckenfield. How am I doing for time, okay? I was walking through Duckenfield and a woman came up. She took both my hands and she said, oh, Reverend Inglis, and she chatted to me. And then she looked at my wife and I thought, she doesn't know my wife. I said, this is my wife. And she went to my wife and held both her hands. And she said, oh, Mrs. Inglis, you are so honored to have a man like this in your life. And my wife looked down at this lady and simply said, hmm. You see, this woman doesn't live with me. And it's when we come into the church of God that we have so desperately to live with the understanding that God 
these are my brothers and sisters. But Father God, I am here to love them, to show them you. That's one of the rules of engagement of the church. Finally, it's a tender heart. Now, that's a good translation, by the way. The actual word is made up of two words. One word is, um, means good, and the other one means bowels. I think tender heart is a much better translation. I think it's far better to say, I felt my heart moved with compassion rather than I had some really good bowel movements. I think that the, the first one is a better translation. The only other place where this word is used is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, where Paul writes, Get rid, are you ready for this? Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, are you ready? Just as Christ has forgiven you. I want to be in that church. I want to be in that church. The church must run on the master's rules of engagement. This is the, the, the statement that was made by a man called Steve Jobs. You've heard of him from Apple? He saw a man called John Scully who wanted to work with him and they met. And John Scully, who was one of the directors of Pepsi, said, no, I can't come. And this is what Steve Jobs said to him. He said to him, listen, John, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? And Jesus says to us, will you come with me? And as he said to Peter, which we translate as, I will make you fishers of men. But what he said was, Peter, come with me and we will take men alive. That's what he said to him. And so I finish with this, having taken up too much of your time, but I want you to listen to what Paul says, and with this I finish. It's Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We need, in a dis desperate age, and in a broken age, to be the church. And those are the first five rules of engagement that we are given. Let's pray. Father, to your mercy, we are debtors alone. We thank you that out of the whole world you have chosen us to be your children. And we know that there are millions of people out there who are still waiting to hear the gospel call. Please help us to be, locally and in this nation, a church that can deal with these people, deal with our new brothers and sisters, in a way that will show the love of God. And to that we say help us to glorify you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching all. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, consider subscribing so that you'll be notified when we add new videos. Thank you. God bless. Take care. Bye.